So good afternoon, everyone. I can see we've uh, got several people uh, logging in. Um, I'm going to give it just a minute or two more for um, all the attendees uh, to get a chance to log on. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to the uh, induction to your basic specialist training program in pediatrics. Um, and uh, congratulations um, on uh, starting the program. Uh, so the pa pandemic has required that we do a lot of things differently this year. Uh, and this is also why we've had to move this induction online, but we still have lots of useful information for you today and we have uh, incorporated a question and answer session at the end to allow you to ask for more information or to clarify anything that uh, we're going to say over the next hour or so. Um, so I'm going to ask um, all of you uh, to please use the uh, Q&A function uh, in your Zoom, you'll see it there at the bottom or the side of your screen, depending on where you have your taskbar docked. Um, it's next to chat. It just says Q&A. Um, so please log your questions as we go along uh, and we will get to them at the end. Um, so for the format, I'll be running through the presentations, uh, some of which are pre-recorded uh, and will be on a schedule, uh, hopefully to allow as much time as possible for those questions at the end. Um, we're going to uh, here, first of all, an address from the National Specialty Director, Connor Hensey. Uh, then I will do a, a short presentation uh, just to give you uh, an overview of the program, uh, some of the uh, key elements um, of the curriculum and what to expect. Uh, this will be followed by a in-depth presentation from Ashling Smith, who's uh, RCPI Education Specialist. Uh, in particular, she will be talking about how to track your training progress on ePortfolio. And then finally, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, a couple of your uh, fellow trainees who have gone through the program and are going to be sharing uh, the benefits of their experience, and they'll be available for the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to go straight into the uh, presentation from National Specialty Director Connor Hensey. My name is Dr. Connor Hensey, along with Dr. Michael O'Neill and Professor John Murphy. We're delighted to welcome you all to the basic specialist training program in pediatrics. Pediatrics is an exciting and very enjoyable career. And you're going to find support from your peers, registrars, consultant trainers, and nursing and other hospital staff throughout your placements. We would expect you will enjoy your training and have all the opportunities you require to develop your skills, knowledge, and clinical acumen over the next two years. The Royal College of Physicians in Ireland, and specifically the Faculty of Pediatrics, have a depth of experience in professional training and will support you throughout the BST programme, the HSC programme, and beyond. <laughs> You'll all know that the BST scheme is typically a two-year scheme where you have opportunities to develop skills in general pediatrics, neonatology, and often other paediatric subspecialties. And our role as your National Specialty Director is to support and guide you throughout this. With the RCPI, we are responsible for the oversight of the training programme. And we'll be organising the study days and coordinating the other training opportunities for you over the next two years. 
along with completing your assessments and taking feedback. We know that for many of you, this is your first experience of working in paediatrics. And it can take time to get used to caring for both children and their families. This can be challenging and thought provoking. We would encourage you to look after yourselves and try and maintain a balance between your work and training and your family life and other pastimes which are important to you. This is more important than ever as we're currently dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and life is very different for us all. We would have loved to have been able to meet with you face to face and get to know you a little better, but obviously that is impossible at present. We will endeavour to continue to connect with you over the coming months and a number of short question and answer sessions so that we can um, ensure that you're settling in over the first couple of months of training. One of the most important aspects of um, the basic specialty training programmes and particularly within paediatrics is the opportunity to connect with other trainees. We are a relatively small specialty and it can be really important and helpful to develop a network of friends and colleagues. It is one of the things we were always told at the end um, of the scheme when we kind of complete our final assessments. The trainees will tell us that one of the most valuable components of their training has been that ability to develop a network of friends and peers. These friends and colleagues will help you in your exam preparation, uh, help you throughout your pediatric career, and will be that support if you encounter particularly busy or difficult times. Um, our study days will continue, and we will be updating the program and sending out to you in the coming weeks. They'll initially be delivered, and certainly until the new year, as webinars and group video sessions. We hope that as things change, we'll be able to get back to some face-to-face -face teaching. Um, the days typically involve trainee case presentations, some uh, focus on professional development, um, and some specialist teaching, usually on one topic, which is delivered by consultants uh, from around the country. And we will hope to be able to continue this format um, remotely. I would encourage you to hit the ground running particularly during the summer months as is a time when it is relatively quiet in pediatric hospitals. This might not be the case if you're in neonatology, although it's still important to plan ahead. Look at your e-portfolio, try and get used to using it, and try and complete some of the mandatory uh, assessments, including observed histories and examinations, and the directly observed procedures that you can complete, and record and log your cases and try and reflect and learn from them. Think about your examinations, and I would encourage most of you to apply for the uh, part one when you are eligible, which will be next year. And if you are going to apply, see if you can get some study leave over the next six months. We want you to contact us if you're running into difficulties, either through the program coordinators or directly um, through your trainers as well as also an option. We would prefer to um, be told about difficulties you're having early to give us a chance to react to them and help you. I'll be available at the end of the induction session as well as the other NSTs to take some questions. And we really look forward to the chance to uh, speak with you again by a video call and catch you up at some time uh, face to face. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, that uh, was uh, Dr. Connor Hensey. Uh, and he will um, be on hand, uh, as he said, uh, at the end of the session for um, more, uh, um, uh, if you have any questions for him. Um, can I ask, uh, was uh, everybody able to hear? You can use the chat function to feed back to me. Um, were you able to see and hear the video? Great. Great, I'm seeing some yeses, good stuff. All right, so um, this next segment, I'm actually just going to share my screen, my PowerPoint since I'm here live. Um, and uh, again, please do uh, log questions via the Q&A. Um, we will be going through those at the end. Um, so I'm going to now share my PowerPoint and talk to you a little bit about um, some key elements of the program. 
So, um, my name is again Melena Martel. I am the uh, coordinator, uh, dedicated coordinator for pediatrics program, both BST and HST. Um, and uh, these are my contact details. They're on the website, um, but uh, you can probably reach me quickest through my email, Melina Martel at rcpi.ie. Um, and uh, you can also uh, raise me or uh, get help from one of my colleagues uh, if you use the general inbox BST at rcpi.ie. Um, but uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you ever need anything. If I don't know the answer, I will find someone who does. Um, so, uh, just a, a word about uh, the governance of your program. Uh, so the national specialty directors have oversight of the uh, uh, basic specialist training program in pediatrics. Uh, they are Connor Hensey, who you just um, uh, watched a video from, uh, and he's based in Temple Street. Dr. Michael O'Neill is based in Mayo, and Professor John Murphy is based in Hollis Street. Um, there's also uh, some regional uh, training offices uh, that are staffed by um, RCPI coordinators. Uh, so if you are in Cork, um, you can uh, reach out to Fiona Collins uh, with any issues related to your training. Um, if you are in Galway, you can reach out to Sheila Kelly. And finally, if you're in Midlands uh, based around Limerick, uh, you can contact Maura Graham. Um, so I'm now going to uh, talk you through, um, sorry, I'm going to talk you through the uh, digital assets, some of the tools that um, and services that you have access to as trainees. Um, your first port of call is the RCPI website. Um, and uh, you'll want to log in uh, if you don't um, know your login or haven't logged in in some time, make sure very first thing that uh, your RCPI username and password is correct. Um, once you log in, this will take you to the digital hub. Um, and uh, there are um, a few different services we'll be talking through today that you access um, via this means. So um, the uh, other thing that you can reach through the digital hub, uh, some useful links here, uh, online journals uh, such as uh, BMJ and the Lancet, uh, research services like PubMed, and there's also um, a link here to the RCPI affinity scheme, which I'll mention later. Um, so just uh, to give you a quick overview um, of the various elements of the program uh, to be aware of and that we're going to cover today. Um, so we're going to talk about the requirements and how to go about achieving them. And you know, once again, if you have any questions about any of this, please um, use the Q&A and we will get back to you at the end. Um, so I'm going to start off with the curriculum. So the BST curriculum actually uh, is on the website um, and it's really good for you to familiar, familiarize yourself with it. Um, you can download it here. Um, it's uh, a summary of all of the skills and achievements that um, you're going to uh, have to accomplish by the end of the two-year program in order to get your BST certificate. Uh, the curriculum involves um, a few different um, outcomes and you are going to be assessed uh, periodically. So for instance, at your uh, rotation, at your workplace, um, you will um, be assessed by your trainer. Um, there are also assessments at the end of year one and year two. Um, and uh, all of the uh, activities and assessments uh, should be uploaded to your ePortfolio. Um, recommend that you do keep this up to date throughout the year as you go along. Don't wait until uh, April with assessments looming to start updating your ePortfolio. Um, your rotations um, as uh, you, most of you are aware, but these are pre-allocated um, and will include the following. So you'll have at least six months in general pediatrics. You'll have six months in neonatology. Uh, you will also be uh, assigned to subspecialties, uh, including um, 
pediatric emergency, you might go into cardiology for six months, but you won't spend more than six months in uh, any one specialty. Um, I see a raised hand. Um, Georgia, you have something to add in chat? Okay, I'm going to carry on. Um, so I'm going to talk to you for just a little bit now about courses and events. Uh, so again, uh, courses uh, can be accessed through the digital hub um, or uh, through courses.rcpi.ie. Um, your RCPI login is required. These are free for trainees. Um, and uh, again, you should try to register for your mandatory courses and your training uh, program study days as early as possible because these do fill up. Um, we're going to be running most of these, um, all of these, uh, remotely uh, online through the end of 2020 at least. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it's um, uh, important that uh, you do when you're made aware of um, a, a course or a scheme to try and get our study day, which we will be scheduling um, in uh, uh, September and beyond, that you do go ahead and enroll as soon as you can. Um, so Brightspace uh, is um, our RCPI virtual learning environment. Uh, contents for courses, uh, both online and some offline and study days, um, are available for here, uh, through here, and your online courses will be completed through this platform. Uh, it also has facility for giving feedback, and you can download your certificates of attendance. Um, this is just a capture of what it looks like when you log into Brightspace, and you'll notice that your courses that you're registered for are here on the left. Okay, so I'm um, going to move on. Apologies. Just a moment to return to screen sharing. Okay, so um, in terms of your mandatory courses, um, we have, or actually we will be pre-allocating uh, some of these to you to, as first years. Um, so watch for an email about that. Uh, if you ever have inquiries about courses, uh, if uh, you're enrolled, when they're gonna be offered, uh, please contact courses at rcpi.ie. Um, this is uh, a, uh, clip from the induction booklet, which we will be sending around. Um, this is actually information uh, based on when we were all um, pre-COVID, when we were all in uh, the office uh, in the college. So uh, these, uh, these courses that are listed as one day, two day workshops, the format now is probably going to be about um, a half day and over Zoom. Um, the online we talked about, you can access that through Brightspace. Um, note that um, some of the requirements uh, you need to arrange yourself. Um, they are run through external organizations or arranged locally. Um, so please do keep those in mind and um, watch for um, updates from when those are offered again uh, and make sure that you sign up. Um, just wanted to quickly mention, uh, there's other learning opportunities um, coming up all the time, both through the college, uh, keep an eye on Brightspace and the faculty page, you'll get emails from me, but also at your site, um, there may be um, opportunities, uh, a uh, doctor there with a particular expertise, uh, chances for you to get a lot of exposure. So please seek those opportunities to, to learn. Talk to your trainer when you get to site about um, what some of the particular opportunities available to you might be. Um, and again, I mentioned Brightspace um, as a place where 
lots of events, not just uh, courses are available. Um, once you've registered, um, there's actually a useful calendar there that you can check on to see um, what's coming up. Um, and if you ever have any questions uh, or need help with Brightspace, um, our CPI operates a help desk, uh, which you can see the, the contact there. Okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about ePortfolio because um, Ashlyn Smith is going to give a more extensive presentation here shortly. Um, but I did want to, again, point out to you that this is accessed through the digital hub. Um, and you can see here where it says new ePortfolio when you log in. Um, so this is a record of all of your training activities, whether it's um, you know, directly observed procedures or you've passed your exam, um, RCPI forms for the end of post, all of that goes into your ePortfolio. And it's tracked against uh, the training requirements for your BST and pediatrics. Um, it also uh, is uh, set up such that once you've completed uh, an activity um, as required, you submit it directly to your trainer to sign off. Uh, so this is why it's really important that uh, this is what you will see when you log in. Uh, it's really important that uh, we have your specialty, your uh, um, training and your trainer entered. Um, we are currently updating this as we speak, um, but you know, going forward, if uh, you happen to notice that um, you're not able to submit something because you don't have a trainer assigned, please get in touch with us right away so that we can update that for you. Um, so just to recap uh, and some useful tips, um, make sure that your post and trainer are correct. Um, you want to meet with your trainer if you haven't already done so this week and agree goals for your post and there's a personal goals form that you should complete and submit. Um, Try to record your activities on a regular basis. I mean, some of you will um, want to do this you know, immediately on the day. Some of you might want to set aside time every few weeks to update your ePortfolio, but do try to do it as you go along. Um, and uh, please do try to submit um, all of the records uh, that um, are associated with your current post before finishing in that post. Okay, I'm gonna move on quickly now to uh, pediatrics exams. Um, so uh, the best person to contact for information about the exams uh, is Louise Tracy. Uh, her remit is the pediatrics exams. You can also direct inquiries to examinations at rcpi.ie. Uh, there will be an information session held on the 12th of August um, and you'll be contacted with further details about that. But for now, I just wanted to note that due to COVID-19, the written exams are going to be held by remote invigilation. Um, so uh, the, uh, there's three parts you see. The part one is a three hour exam with a single best, 100 best answer questions. Uh, you cannot sit this uh, until 18 months after your primary medical degree graduation. Um, if once you pass the part one, you can register for the part two, which can consists of single best answer paper and a short answer question paper. And once that's completed, you can then take the part, uh, part two clinical or some people refer to it as the part three. All right, so um, the, one of the other really important uh, parts of your program is gonna be the annual evaluations. These usually take place in um, April and May. We are a little bit late with them this year. Um, this is um, a meeting between you and the national specialty directors. Um, uh, they're going to be um, looking to see how you're progressing through your program, but it's also an opportunity for you to give feedback and ask questions. Uh, so um, this is um, a really good opportunity for um, you to uh, both get feedback um, on how your progress um, is going, but also to give feedback to the national specialty directors about, you know, how you feel about your, your posting or, you know, aspects of the program. So, um, last but not least, um, what you're all aiming for is certification. So, it's important to be aware of uh, what you need to uh, do to uh, satisfy the exit criteria. You're going to have to ensure that the minimum requirements um, listed in the curriculum that we mentioned earlier have all been met. Um, you're going to need to have the end of post assessment forms uh, completed for each of the 
rotations that you've done. Um, of course, you'll need to pass your uh, MRCPI examinations, uh, and then you'll need to have uploaded um, certifications uh, and your diploma um, in order to be signed off uh, and as successfully having completed the program. Um, just very briefly, I wanted to mention uh, some of the benefits. Uh, you'll be getting an email from me soon if you haven't already regarding the Student Leap Card. Um, so you get a free Student Leap Card. Uh, applications are now open and uh, you do need to have those back to us by August 12th. Um, you also, as we mentioned earlier, have access uh, via the website uh, to medical journals. Um, there's also, uh, for those of you that uh, maybe would like a little bit of uh, COVID safe retail therapy, um, there's a um, reward scheme that offers discounts on uh, um, shopping and there's some good deals to be had there. Um, and a uh, very uh, good benefit is that you have free access to uh, master classes and conferences operated by the RCPI. Um, so just to wrap up, key points to remember, um, be familiar with your curriculum, meet with your trainer, um, make yourself familiar with the RCPI digital hub and the digital services, um, get started on your ePortfolio now and maintain it as you go along. Um, be aware of uh, your course dates and register for uh, course dates and study days early. Um, look for other learning opportunities available to you um, at, throughout the year and at your site. And finally, uh, be thinking about uh, your exams and preparing to take those uh, at your first opportunity. Um, some of you uh, may find that you need to get some additional support or information through your program. And it's important to know that there's lots of places that you can go for help and lots of people that are available to support you. So this starts with your trainer, but you know, also you can go to the national specialty directors. And of course you can come to me. Um, as I said, if I don't know the answer to a question that you have, I will find someone who does. Uh, there's also the regional site coordinators I mentioned earlier um, in Cork, Galway, um, and Limerick. Um, Sites uh, also have um, a trainee representative um, that you can make contact with or, you know, other, an SPR, um, your peers uh, are frequently good sources of support. Um, there's a trainees committee um, and you can reach out to trainee committee representatives. Um, medical manpower uh, or occupational health at your training site. And finally, um, RCPI has a dedicated health and well-being department uh, who you can reach through wellbeing at rcpi.ie. Okay, I'm going to leave you with a few uh, links on the RCPI website. Again, if uh, you're looking for the BST training curriculum, uh, that actually is downloadable from uh, basics, uh, about basic specialist training. Um, it's also useful to check in on the Faculty of Pediatrics site. Um, there's lots of um, announcements about upcoming events, recent developments in pediatrics, and uh, links to the training programs um, and guidelines and so forth. The um, documents uh, that you might need as you're going through your program and policies, uh, including a BST training guide, are available from important documents for current trainees. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a dedicated health and well-being department and you can read about um, what they do and how to get in touch uh, via this link. So thank you to all of you for your time. Best of luck in your program. And I am now going to um, turn the floor over to Ashlyn Smith. Um, so once again, I'm going to ask just before I change over, was everybody able to see my slides? I'm happy to share that uh, presentation around afterwards. Okay, great. Um, so I am now going to um, share a pre-recorded video with you from um, Ashley Smith, who's educational specialist. Um, might be good to take some notes here because she is going to be covering lots of useful detail about using your ePortfolio. Yeah. 
and apologies. I'm going to try that one more time. Okay. Hi, I'm Ashley Smith. I'm an education specialist here in the SPI. I'm the assessment and program development manager. So that means that I work with your trainers and the national specialty directors to develop the content of your training program and also the assessments that go along with it. So I'm going to talk to you about your training curriculum, um, very briefly about your e-portfolio and some of the assessments that go along with the program. This is just a brief introduction. We're going to do a full half hour going through all of the elements of the curriculum and all of the elements of the e-portfolio in a couple of weeks time, but we just want to give you a little bit of time to, to read your curriculum uh, get started on those so that we can be a bit more focused in the questions that people have at that point. But after this presentation, we'll be on for the Q&A and you can ask me any specific burning questions then. So your curriculum document is available on the website. It's also available on your ePortfolio. So when you log into the URSPI website and you click on the tab, um, so the curriculum looks like this on the cover. You'll see sometimes we update versions of the curriculum to try and make it easier to follow. We're at the end of a pilot for outcome based education for basic specialist trainings. So, what that means is we satisfied that we've got the right content for the program, but sometimes the instructions that go along with the curriculum aren't as clear as we would like them to be. So, we may publish new versions of the document throughout the year. That won't mean your requirements have changed, but in some places they may have been clarified based on your feedback with your findings. So if you're not sure what something says, get in touch with Maria, Milena, or even myself, and we will make sure that we bring that feedback to the NSDs and revise what we can of the instructions that are in the, in the curriculum. And the same goes for ePortfolio, because getting feedback from you guys is really important to make sure that it's clear and understandable what you're working through. So just a quick overview of what this document includes. The introduction is uh, post requirements, policies, what structure you have to go through in terms of your time spent in post. Most of that is found in your trainings regulation document, which I think um, Melena will have, have told you about. Um, so, so that's more comprehensive. So this is just a brief overview. And it's mainly there because we publish this on the website and people often look to that first. The core professional skills section outlines what's expected from you in terms of professional conduct. It's guided by the Medical Council standards. But it includes things like well-being and also prescribing infection control, all of the standards that you'd expect in the hospital, but things like communication and teamwork are in there as well. Um, it's important to remember that if you're going to be giving feedback on your professionalism, it's probably going to be in the structure of actual outcomes from here. So that's why they're written as, as outcomes for your training as well. And also for yourself, if you want to convey examples of how good professional behavior on your behalf, behalf um, you can use that to structure it. The final tip is that when you're doing your exam, scenarios for things like communications and ethics stations will be taken from your professional uh, professional standards that are expected. So it's a good place to look at if you're trying to think of, of scenarios that may come up there. You may be guided by the medical council standards on that. The specialty section is what I'm mostly going to look at today. So this outlines the outcomes that are expected from you on completion of the ST. So what's needed to get signed off in your annual assessment and in your final assessment at the end of two years. It includes things like examinations and also courses that you have to attend, um, but mainly what we're, we're looking at here is the actual clinical requirements that we expect them. Okay. So I'm going to talk about training goals. When I'm talking about training goals, they're the groupings of the outcome. You also have your personal goals and your personal goal plan. Your personal goals should be based around your outcomes, but also your overall career goals, so what you're going to achieve in the post. And it's important to talk about them because there might be some posts that you're in that are better opportunities than others to complete outcomes. For example, certain procedures might be easier to get in one hospital over another. So the training goals reflect your continuum of progress. They're evaluated at the end of each post and they make the main structure for your end of year evaluations as well. The outcomes are more focused on your workplace-based assessments. 
So things like performing a physical, or sorry, six week examination. So you're going to have where you, uh, you're going to have, have uh, outcomes that are written like this with specific tasks, okay? And some of them will be assessments like a directly observed assessment. So you have to go into your portfolio, you have to work with your trainer to fill in specific uh, checklists around what's expected from you in a good standard of, of six week examination. Um, others might be more based around a discussion, and there are also some self assessments in there as well. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So, this is the main grouping of your training goals and your outcomes. So, you have history and physical examination, clinical presentations, recognition, diagnostics and procedures, and then presentations, treatment, and management. So, that's, I think, roughly what everyone expects, right, from the level that we're working towards. So, history taking, physical exam, clinical assessment tasks, also under history and physical examination. Under presentations, this is really where you're recording your case experience and also your experience of recognizing emergencies. So it's not expected that you're going to be able to, to treat every emergency in a lot of places. It's going to be your SPR who's doing that. And you're obviously trying to work to your own level, but you should be able to recognize these presentations. That's why the presentations and the treatment and management are different sections because not everything that you're expected to recognize, you're expected to be able to treat. Diagnostics and procedures, you have the identification of underlying pathology and risk factors associated with procedures and, uh, and others. And um, you have some diagnostic tasks, some independently performed procedures, and observation of procedures. So observation of procedures means procedures that you're expected to observe. It will specify in an assessment if you're going to be observed during a procedure. For the observation of procedures, that's just where you're going to log into your portfolio yourself and say, I saw this. And as I already mentioned, treatment and management is about the cases that you're expected to be able to discuss management and follow-up of and log examples for where you've done this. And the same with the management of emergencies. If it's within your scope of practice, then you're expected to have logged that. But we do specify which outcomes come under these. So there's lists that come under each of these and they're in your curriculum. There's a summary table, but it's also page by page in the document itself. So when you log into ePortfolio, you'll have your plus button there, and then these are all the forms that appear. Okay? So when you're going to be, uh, you're going to be logging uh, something that you've done or something that you've experienced, you need to know what the right form is. It's worth just taking a little bit of time to look through these at the start. Um, I know it's, it's kind of hard to read when it says BST, Pediatrics, traditional professional experience, and it says the same thing, everything. They are alphabetical once you cover up the BST pediatrics, so it might make it easier to, to navigate it that way yourself, depending on your preference. And on your phone, they're a little more, um, they're laid out as one list. When you, when you log in on the website, they're, they're laid out in the two columns. Um, some of the forms are very specific, so you'll easily see what they are. For example, assessment of reduced consciousness and coma is specifically related to the outcomes that and some of the others are a bit broader. Um, so case-based discussion, for example, applies to a number of different things. So in the follow-up webinar, I'll go through each of the forms, but for now, I'm just going to give you a few examples. So an obvious one is physical examination. So here you've got, you need this to be signed off nine times. Um, it's done during training. So what you're going to do is ask a trainer or senior team member to observe you completing physical examination. You submit the form with the assessment completed and your trainer signs off on that. And that, that if they didn't assess you themselves, that the person who assessed you was appropriate. There's a drop down there which gives you each type of uh, physical examination that has to be completed. There is an other there. For example, if you're doing some kind of specialty exam that was in a rotation that not everyone's going to have access to. It will be completed under other. Case-based discussions. So this is where you sit down with your trainer and you actually have a structured conversation about cases that you've logged. Okay, so there's some types of cases where we want you to actually have specific experience. Um, so for example, uh, eczema. So understanding how to manage a primary level eczema. That's something that you should all be able to discuss with your trainer. And you're going to choose when you do these they're the type of things to be looking out for in a um, in a goals meeting. If there's an outcome that you think might meet, uh, you might be able to meet in this rotation. So when you do your first read through your curriculum, look for things like that. So 
obviously if you were in a dermatology pose, you know, that would be the given that you would try and get that signed off there. But that's not something everyone's going to be in. So if you're in a hospital where you know that um, all the dermatology referrals go specifically to one person and you're never going to see them, then don't bother trying to put that in as a goal for this rotation. You'll get it somewhere else later on. Some of the forms, for example, for diagnostic tasks and procedures could be split up into three or four different types of assessment. So for diagnostic tasks, you have self-assessment. So this is where you're filling in that you've done it. And at your end of post, what will happen is your trainer will just say, I see that you filled in that you did. Um, you had a case where you had to stabilize the neonate or if there was a um, neonate resuscitation. And these things will be signed off as your trainer saying, okay, I'm happy that you completed that self-assessment and you're aware of everything that was included in it. Um, discussions is where you just sat down and talked to your trainer about something and your trainer doesn't have to fill anything in. You go away and you fill that in. So anything that says self-assessment, it is just where you fill in that you've done it in the hospital. Directly observed is where you've actually done it with your trainer. So there's an investigation of procedure that was directly observed, okay? So there's an example there, the six that you need to get signed off during training. Now you can do the say lumbar puncture. You know, some of you are going to have had experience in that previously. So you might be quite confident coming in saying, okay, I'm going to get that signed off in, the, in this rotation and your trainer can do that straight away. For some of the rest of you who haven't actually done it, it's still worth doing the directly observed assessment to get feedback and just expect for it to be marked as formative. So formative means I'm doing this for feedback I'm not doing it to look for successful sign-off. Um, and most of the time, both you and your trainer will know going into it what the end outcome of that is going to be. And if you're not sure, then ask the trainer, do you think I'm ready to be formally assessed in this, or will we just do a, do a formative assessment to get the feedback against the uh, list of criteria that's there? So when you sit down to make your goals with your trainer, have read right through your curriculum so you know roughly what you're doing, and also have a bit of a think about where you're going long term. This is just your first rotation, so you don't have to know where you want to be at the end of BST. But if you have an idea, start thinking about working towards that now and getting experience towards that. Especially with things like research or audit, you don't have to do those things at BST. There will be opportunities to say, get your name on a paper or do presentations. And they're worth thinking about, especially if you're coming in having already had a year or two experience in pediatrics, or maybe you've already got some parts of your exam you know, it's good to start thinking about doing those additional things and have those conversations with your trainer. But for the vast majority of people, what you're looking for in your first goals meeting is what requirements are specific to this post. The neonatal ones are going to be really obvious. If you're in a neonatal post, you want to pick them out and do them first. For some of the others, you want to say to your trainer, you know, will this be a good post for me to get this experience? Um, and your trainer is going to give you a pretty good steer on that most of the time. So try and do that early on, and it will take a lot of the stress out of it. So do be, and most people know the SMART goals acronym by now, you've probably encountered it a hundred times at, at undergrad and everything else. But be specific. Make sure that your goal is measurable. Make sure it's going to be achievable. Don't put in something that you're just not going to get the opportunity to do in post. Um, be realistic with yourself and make sure you've given yourself a timeline on those things. Your goal for uh, post one could just be to register for an attempt for your part one of your exam. They don't have to be super ambitious either. So just be, be kind to yourself while you're settling into the program. So when it comes to your program requirements, as I've already said, know what the outcomes are. It's going to make it easier to go through. Plan for your exam. So ask your trainer, you know, and ask other people who are coming into posts or leaving posts how busy different posts are. That's going to give you an idea of whether you're going to be able to actually get time to study for your exam um, and prepare for it. The exams are based on case-based uh, experience. So the trainers are writing them based on cases they're seeing with their trainees in the hospital. There's not going to be anything exceptionally hard there. There is some things that you do have to have read up on, up-to-date literature, up-to-date guidelines, things like that. We'll have another webinar session that's specific to exams for anyone who hasn't got those. But mainly what I'm saying to you right now is plan the timeline around that. Give yourself the opportunity to fail one part of the exam. It's not set up for you to fail, but it is set up to measure your experience that you have. And uh, you know, it's no, it's no issue if people don't make, uh, don't pass everything first time. It's really common. 
So just lay, leave yourself enough time to at least plan that you might need to reset one or two parts of the exam. Take advantage of learning opportunities that are there. The courses that are run are run for a specific reason because there's feedback on a need for them from the class. Do make sure you turn up if you book onto a course and do cancel if you're not going to turn up. You're pre-allocated onto a lot of your courses as, as Elaine has already said, but there will be some other opportunities that come up. The NSDs and pediatrics put a lot of work into making sure your study dates are really good opportunities to learn up-to-date information. That's going to be really important as well when you're coming to, to learning for your exam, but also just for clinical practice. And hopefully, if we're able to run more than in person this year, obviously we don't know how, how that's going to go. Um, you know, they're really good opportunities to get to know the other people on your program. Um, grant brains, MDTs, guest speakers, all of these things are really good learning opportunities in hospital. Remember that a lot of the resources in our supply are free for you. So do watch the website. And if there's something coming up like a master class that you're interested in, do join it because there are going to be things outside of your specialty, like leadership, um, quality improvement, things like that, that you can sit in on and they might give you an idea of where you'd like to go longer term with your career. Um, so what I think you've already had a talk um, on this earlier, but just keeping in mind, you know, they do expect professional standards. You're driving your own learning here. You're driving your own engagement with the program. You have to be coming to them and saying, okay, here's what I want to do. Yes, they're going to be busy as well. So you need to make sure that you do things that, that make it easier for them to help you get to where you want to be. Do communicate your leave on time. Do manage your time. It's going to make things less stressful for, for everyone. And if you're having a problem, make sure it's flagged appropriately. So talk to your trainer, talk to your coordinator, contact someone within RCPI, and we'll do our best to try and get the right help for you for what you need. So don't be sitting at home worrying about something by yourself. Your training reps as well will be really good in kind of guiding you in the right direction. So find out who they are. Um, so initiate three assessments at least in your first post, okay? So you need to initiate your goal meeting. Then you need to follow up with your trainer to make sure that you do at least some observed assessments. If you do at least one observed assessment in each post, you're not going to have any difficulty getting through the more than the two years, and you're not going to be chasing up at the end to get your portfolio completed. Prepare for your end of post. So make sure everything's filled in. Do try and at least be that person who fills out your portfolio at least once a week. But realistically, you should be able to actually fill it out daily. But I know that that's not always, you know, people don't always have the capacity just mentally even to do that at the end of the day. But try to get in good habits with it early on, and you're going to make life easier for yourself throughout the program. Finally, seek out opportunities to learn. If there's something that you want and it's not available to you, or it's not obviously available to you, talk to your trainer, see if you're going to be able to get an opportunity for that. See if there's something being run by another specialty that you might be able to, to get involved in. Um, so that you can make the most of the time that's there for you. And also, you know, actively just read into what's already being offered. Do check up on things regularly. And sometimes you look at stuff and say, oh, that'd be really good. I'd like to go to it. And you just forget about it or forget that it's on. So try and put things into your calendar if you see them advertised. Um, because even if you're really enthusiastic about the time, you don't necessarily always remember it. So I know that's quite a lot of information. As I said, we're going to have two follow-up webinars on this anyway one on your requirements and one on your exams. So both of those I'll be involved in. If you have any questions that you want specifically addressed on them, you can send them in in advance. In the meantime, if you've got anything just directed towards uh, towards Malena, and we'll make sure that we get, get an answer for you. And I'll be on in the Q&A at the end. So thanks very much. And we'll hopefully see you all in person at some point and talk to you again soon. Great. So um, I uh, hope that uh, you all found that uh, useful and informative. Um, I'm just aware of time, but um, before we go to the Q&A, we have um, a couple of presentations from uh, trainees who've already gone through the program that um, I think that you'll really appreciate uh, having a perspective um, that isn't RCPI or one of the program director directors. So I'm going to start um, by uh, introducing Sarah O'Laughlin. Um, she has a presentation uh, for you uh, that involves some useful tips for surviving on call.
Miss Sarah, I'm one of the first year. Sorry, give me just a moment and I will get that pulled up again. Miss Sarah, I'm one of the first year PSS viewers and I'm going to give you my 10 tips for surviving SHO calls. Firstly, congratulations on getting onto the scheme and I hope you're settling in um, to your new jobs. Um, I know how daunting it is facing into your first few calls and it is a steep learning curve at first, but, but I promise that people will be looking out for you and you will learn a lot. My first piece of advice would be to get organised know when you're on call, arrive on time. If you're getting bleeped from the different wards, then just write, write everything down and try your best to prioritise your tasks. Um, I'd recommend doing a sweep of the wards um, in the evening time, just to tidy up all those little jobs that are waiting for you. And it's also important to know where your next meal is coming from. So know when the canteen closes um, or bring your own food, um, but don't be surviving on tea and toast every time you're on call. I'd recommend um, downloading some of these really handy apps. The first one is the Common Formulary. Um, it costs five ninety nine to download and um, it's got all of your drug doses and um, it's got your antimicrobial guidelines. Um, the second app is the RCH clinical guidelines. This one is really good if you're working in ED or um, if you're in a paediatric assessment unit and it, it literally has a guideline for like every paediatric presentation um, and you should obviously be using your local guidelines too. Um, the, in neonates, the Billy app is great for accurately plotting um, the bilirubin on a phototherapy graph and neonate is great for calculating drug doses and knowing lines and tubes for neonate resuscitation. Um, so um, I would recommend learning off how to calculate your maintenance fluids because it's probably the thing you'll be asked to do most often when you're on call on top of turning per seat mop and ibuprofen. So um, the calculation that is used most often is 100 mils per kilo per day for the first 10 kilos, 50 mils per kilo per day for the second 10 kilos, and 20 mils per kilo per day for every kilo after that. Um, and we, we generally use 0.9% saline and 5% dextrose for our maintenance foods. And um, there are lots of online calculators that you could use to calculate this, um, but I think it's one that's worth learning off the top of your head. Um, the next piece of advice would be to prescribe clearly and accurately, because if you don't get it right the first time, you will get bleeped to correct it later. Paediatric nurses are not going to let you away with much. So make sure that your handwriting is legible and don't use generic names unless it's an exceptional circumstance and check and double check your drug doses. Use the BNF, it will be on every board. And if you're not sure about something, just ask someone to check with you. So the next tip would be to listen, um, particularly to a worried parent, because parents do know their children best. And if they're really worried that their child has deteriorated or that the child is very sick, you know, they're probably right. Um, so it's definitely worth listening. And um, secondly, you should definitely listen if a nurse is calling you to say that they're worried about a patient, because nurses are excellent at picking up on a sick child. So if they're worried, then you should be worried too. Um, now this is probably the most important piece of advice. Hi everyone, I'm really sorry, apparently you were not able to see that video, um, which is a shame because it's a very good one. Um, I'm actually going to start that one again from uh, the top, if that's okay.
Miss Sarah, I'm on it with Miss Sarah, I'm on it with first year feeds as viewers, and I'm going to keep. Okay, I'm going to try sharing my screen again now. Right, 10 tips for surviving SHO call. Firstly, congratulations on getting onto the scheme and I hope you're settling in um, to your new jobs. Um, I know that John Deed is facing into your first few calls and it is a steep learning curve at first, but, but I promise that we will be looking out for you and we will learn a lot. My first piece of advice would be to get organized, know when you're on call, arrive on time, if you're getting bleeped from the different wards, um, just write, write everything down and try your best to prioritise your tasks. Um, I'd recommend doing a sweep of the wards um, in the evening time just to tidy up all those little jobs that are waiting for you. And it's also important to know where your next meal is coming from. So know when the canteen closes um, or bring your own food. Um, but don't be surviving on tea and toast every time you're on call. I'd recommend um, downloading some of these really handy apps. The first one is the Crumlin Formulary. Um, it costs $5.99 to download. Um, it's got all of your drug doses and um, it's got your antimicrobial guidelines. Um, the second app is the RCH Clinical Guidelines. This one is really good if you're working in the ED or um, if you're in a paediatric assessment unit. And it, it literally has a guideline for like, every paediatric presentation. Um, and you should obviously be using your local guidelines too. Um, the, in neonates, the Billy app is great for accurately plotting um, the bilirubin on a phototherapy graph. And neonate is great for calculating drug doses and knowing lines and tubes for neonate resuscitation. Um, so um, I would recommend learning off how to calculate your maintenance fluids because it's probably the thing we will be asked to do most often when you're on call on top of charting paracetamol and ibuprofen. So um, the calculation that is used most often is 100 mils per kilo per day for the first 10 kilos, 50 mils per kilo per day for the second 10 kilos, and 20 mils per kilo per day for every kilo after that. Um, and we, we generally use 0.9% saline and 5% dextrose for our maintenance foods. And there are lots of online calculators that you could use to calculate this, um, but I think it's one that's worth learning off the top of your head. Um, the next piece of advice would be to prescribe clearly and accurately, because if you don't get it right the first time, you will get bleached to correct it later. Pediatric nurses are not going to let you away with much. So make sure that your handwriting is legible and um, don't use generic names unless it's an exceptional circumstance and check and double check your drug doses. Use the BNF, it will be on every ward. And if you're not sure about something, just ask them to check with you. So the next tip would be to listen, um, particularly to a worried parent, because parents do know their children best. And if they're really worried that their child has deteriorated or that the child is very sick, you know, they're probably right. And um, so it's definitely worth listening. And um, secondly, you should definitely listen if a nurse is calling you to say that they're worried about a patient because nurses are excellent at picking up on a sick child. So if they're worried, then you should be worried too. And um, this is probably the most important piece of advice that you'll hear today. And that is always, always, if you're worried or if you're lost, or you don't know what to do next, ask for help. And in paediatrics, everyone is really approachable. The nurses, um, the regs, the consultants, if you're stuck, we would prefer that you ask for help early rather than struggling on your own. So you're not alone. Don't be afraid to ask for help and ask early. And um, probably the thing that you're most dreading about call is putting in cannulas and taking gloves. And um, the key to success is to have everything prepared 
prepared. So make sure that you have everything on your tray or your trolley before you go near the patient. Um, think beforehand about analgesia. So can I use sweeties? Um, how long has the amateur been on for? Um, do I need a cold spray for an older child? Um, make sure that you have help and lots of hands on deck to hold the child, um, to distract them with the video um, or the iPad. Um, and in neonates especially, it's important to have someone help you secure your lines, particularly when you're first learning. Um, if you've tried once or twice and you're not getting anywhere or you can't see a good vein, then ask for help. Well, we would much prefer if um, um, you know you had a second pair of eyes look at the child rather than struggling away on your own. And these yellow gel coats are essential on your own call, um, so you should always have a few in your back pocket. Um, there are a few things that you can do to make life easier for the on-call SHO. Um, and so, for example, if you have a long-term patient, just check on a Friday if their drug credits needs to be rewritten just to save the on-call um, person um, rewriting the whole thing on Saturday. Um, if you have a patient on the ward who you think um, might need to be reviewed later on or who needs to have bloods done, um, give the on-call as they show a call or a text before you leave. It'll help them to plan their evening a bit better. And in the neonates, the weekend baby checks can be really busy. So if you can on Friday, get as many checks done before you go home and it will make life a lot easier for the um, for the weekend baby check person. Um, goes away saying that you won't be able to look after anyone else if you're not looking after yourself. So try to take breaks and um, eat and it's always a good idea to coordinate your, your dinner or your lunch with the registrar that you're on with just for a bit of company. Um, try your best to keep hydrated and if you do get a chance to sleep then you should take that opportunity because even a 20 minute nap can improve your concentration and improve your mood. Um, and my last piece of advice would be to never ignore an unexplained tachycardia. So if you have a child with a persistent tachycardia, even when the temperature has settled or you've corrected their dehydration, then you should be thinking about um, possible bacterial infection or sepsis. So don't put it down to anxiety. <laughs> um, so that's all for me. Thank you for listening and I wish you all the best of luck in the next few weeks. I'm going to hand you over to John now who will be talking to you about making the most of the BST. Bye. Great. So um, I am going to now play uh, our last video. Sorry about the glitch there earlier. Um, we uh, are, as a result, just running a few minutes behind schedule, but um, I think that um, we'll be all willing to stay on to answer questions uh, for as long as you need us here. So um, our last presenter is John Covney, um, and he's going to share some additional advice and useful things to know um, to uh, have success in your training program. John Cogney is my name. I'm a first year SPR and I've been asked to talk to you guys today at your induction uh, regarding some of the non clinical aspects of the BST and try to give you some tips based on my experience with the program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all. I know that you come from a wide range of backgrounds. Some of you will come straight from intern year and others will have some pediatric experience. And I'd like to say you're all welcome. Tell you more than anything that I really enjoyed my two years in PST and I found that over the time I learned a lot and ultimately at the end of the two years I feel much more comfortable in caring for sick children than I did at the start and I hope that all of you can get that out of the programme as well as, as, well as, as lots of enjoyment. 
Um, I am conscious that in days like today, uh, you can have, it can feel like, I suppose, that there is lots and lots and lots of requirements uh, being explained to you. And it could be like, sometimes they're overwhelming. I can feel like there's loads and loads of things to do. And where will you ever find the time? You know, it'll be a little bit like this cat trying to balance a, a million things or keep a load of plates spinning. Um, but I think it's important to not get too overwhelmed by it. While there is a significant amount of, um, I suppose, uh, non-clinical commitments to the BST, I suppose the, the goal of all of them really is to, uh, is to improve, is to help. Uh, help you learn how to be better at looking after sick children, really. And um, they are all quite manageable. And I think the, the key to uh, managing them is to be reasonably time efficient and to be, uh, I suppose, on top of it, uh, really, from, from the get-go. I feel like I'm kind of going to go through a to-do list uh, with you all and talk to some of the kind of main non-clinical aspects of the BST. Um, but I put up the to-do list also because I think organisation is really important and it wouldn't have been the strongest skill of mine when I came out of medical school, but it's something I've learned over time is really useful. And I, I think maybe the first tip I give is to try and be very organised in, um, especially in the non-clinical aspect of the BST. It's very useful clinically as well, but I think it's, it's really important to be organised because you can know what you need to do make time for doing it and also make sure that you make time for doing other things that aren't part of the BST and, and make time for other things in your life. And I think uh, that is really important um, and being organised allows you to do that better. So I think it's something to work on if, if, if it's not something that is, is already a strong point of yours. Before I go through the to-do list, so I want to point out something that I, I know that Sarah has talked to you about earlier, from a clinical point of view, but also from a non-clinical point of view. If you're stuck, ask for help, and it might sound really, really basic, but I think it's, it's a mantra of pediatrics, really. If you don't know, ask for help. Everyone would be much rather to ask for help rather than trying to know how long and uh, not know what you're doing. That works both clinically and non-clinically. And actually being part of the BST, while there's loads of additional responsibilities, you do get additional support. So you have the college uh, and you have, that includes the NSDs who will be here today, and also those working for the college to support you. So you do have lots of people to ask for help if, if you're struggling. And I think if I was to give one message and you were to ignore everything else I said in this presentation, that if you're struggling with anything on, on the BST, ask for help early. I put a list of other people to ask. And I think uh, often the regs who just be the BST are, are a great help, or the SHOs maybe were their second year of BST, a lot of tips. Anyway, back to the to-do list, and I want to talk about a few different things that are part of not really components of the BSD and give you a little quick couple of things. First is regarding exams. Um, I think it's, I'll just explain how they work. So uh, there are three parts. You need to pass each part before advancing to the next part. Uh, the first part is an MCQ exam. The second part, part two written, is a MCQ exam and a short paper exam, they will take place on the same day and you need to pass both parts of them uh, to pass the paper. And then the final part is clinical examination, six station, Oxford. Um, in terms of preparing for exams, I've, I've read a short time study, so I'm not going to go through preparing for the exam, but I'll point you again in the direction of SHOs and registrars who have recently completed and they'll be probably the best people to give you guidance on how to best study for the exams, but there is lots of resources available. The other thing I flag at this time, it might sound a little bit uh, defeatist, but in the group of people who I did the BST with, there was very few people who passed each examination on their first attempt. Um, some people did, but the vast majority of people didn't. Um, and I think it's important to know that because for some people who did fail, uh, they were very upset by it. They'd gone through, I suppose, school and college with rarely failing exams. These exams are difficult, they're not impossible, but it's not uncommon for people to fail them. And I want to flag that in advance more from uh, psychologically, really, to, to be understanding that it's, it's a, quite a possible occurrence 
and even a probable occurrence. Um, and so that if it occurs for you, that you are prepared for it. And I just want to flag that because I know for a number of people, it, would, it felt like a massive setback. But in reality, they were excellent doctors um, and they passed them on repeat and, and are brilliant. And so failing one of these examinations isn't a judgment on you as a, as a, as a paediatrician. Sometimes you just need a little bit of luck with them. And I don't know, I think that's really important because it has uh, knocked a few people back in their confidence and please don't let it knock you back if you don't pass them. I'll move on to courses and again, I'll be brief if I can. There is six mandatory courses that you must complete to complete the BST. Um, the top three are organised before CPI. The tip that I would give for these is book them early, they book out. So you will get an email from the university guy saying the course are open for booking probably the next few weeks. And I'll try to book them on the second day. But you to book out within three or four days. And it's just be difficult if they only book for booking once a year, so then you'd be left to try to book them at least for next year. And it's nice to get them in there. Uh, the other three courses are organized locally, that's the section of gold, APS and NRP. You're going to use the rest to get a place on APS is organized in a number of different hospitals and, and also is organized by private companies. So it's usually less to get a place on NRP, everyone's going to be to have that organized for them. Many of you are probably doing it in the next couple of weeks, but it'll be organized when you go to your uh, neonatal placement for sure. So um, so don't worry so much about getting that organized in infection control, then that's also done locally. Another thing I want to talk briefly about is another mandatory requirement, I suppose, is, is the e-portfolio. And so essentially it's a logbook online. Uh, you know, there's there's lots of bells and whistles with it, but it's a logbook where you can record your experience with training online. And there's two things I flag in this that are really useful. The first is that there kind of is a goals form that you fill out with your trainer in the first few weeks. I strongly encourage you to do that in the first couple of weeks. This is something that you may need to take ownership of and you may need to, so to go find your trainer, arrange a time to meet them and set goals for the six months. It's really important to have those goals because I think it helps uh, focus your mind on, on what you're hoping to do. Um, really, the tip would be to take ownership of it. At times, the trainers will have lots of other things going on and they may not, might not find you to do this, but you have to, I suppose, take control of it and find them, to make sure it gets done. And the second thing I'd like towards you in the portfolio is, is similarly at the end of the term, there is an end of term assessment form that you do through the portfolio. Again, take ownership and contact your train for, uh, so that you can get that done. Colleagues had trouble in that they maybe left it to the last minute and their trainer was away maybe at the last week of rotation. So be, I'd be keen to advise you to contact your trainer, uh, you know, maybe with two or three weeks to go in the rotation, say, look, we need to set half an hour or an hour aside to go through this form um, at the end of, end of the placement. It's a requirement, it's something that you have to do. And if you don't do it during your time in placement, it gets really difficult to go back to a hospital. It might be a long way away from where, you're, uh, where you move to on your next job. So those two forms are things that I'd really um, I'd like to flag. The rest of it is just a log book logging your experience. So fill that out as you see fit. Some people like doing it regularly, other people like to do it maybe uh, once a month or something. That, that's what I found is useful. I'm going to talk very briefly, I see my time is, is starting to run out about research. It's not a mandatory part of the programme, but it's something that you'd be um, expected to do. The two or three tips I would give would be try and take on a piece of research that is achievable, something that you honestly feel that you can complete in six months. Try and start a piece of research or audit or quality improvement early in the six month period to give you the best chance of completing it. And pick something that you're interested in. I find that if you're not very interested in it and you run into difficulties with it, you're more likely not to complete the piece of work and you can spend some time on it without achieving it. I'd also like to flag something I didn't know in my first year meetings. There's an Irish Pediatric Association meeting. It happens in December every year, the 10th and 11th this year. And it's a really good meeting to try and get to. I imagine it's going to be a virtual meeting this year, um, but it's a really good meeting from a BST point of view. There's presentations from national and international experts, and also lots of presentations of research from colleagues. And if you do have any research projects that, you're, that you have completed, uh, it's worth submitting them for this meeting. There's many other ones, but this one is just a useful local feedback meeting. I'm going to finish because my time is over, but we're returning to the main message of there's lots to do on the 
BST, both clinically and non-clinically. But if you're running into any trouble with it, ask for help at Air Music Bank. I look forward to meeting you all. Uh, it's a privilege to get to talk to you today. And um, I'll be around for questions. Please don't hesitate. Thanks, Neil. Hello, John. Hello, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hello, Neil. Hello, Hello, uh, that's uh, all the presentations we have today, and um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to um, all of the uh, people that contributed presentations, uh, Dr. Hensey, uh, uh, Ashling Smith, Sarah Laughlin, uh, and uh, John Coveney. Um, so I'm now going to open the floor up to questions, um, asking the panelists to come in, and we have... Um, I see quite a few that have been logged over the course of the last hour or so. so, um, so I also wanted to introduce you to uh, someone who I didn't mention earlier. Um, uh, my boss, the manager of my department, Maria Golden, is on the line. Um, so when I kept saying that if I don't know an answer, I uh, will find uh, someone who does, I frequently turn to Maria. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm uh, uh, going to go ahead and um, start with, let's see. So uh, an attendee asks, um, how do we know who our trainer is? Um, so who wants to take that one? Uh Sorry, I, I can take that one. So your trainer is typically, usually in each department, you will be assigned a trainer. And usually that will be one a consultant who's completed the train the trainer program with the RCPI, or if they haven't been able to have access, they'll be assigned a, a place in the next six to 12 months. So typically you will be assigned within your specialty and your trainer should let you know. The college will usually have a list of those trainers and sometimes there is a bit of movement. So if you're not certain, uh, because in many cases the posts would have been associated with one or two consultants and now sometimes those departments have increased in number to three or four consultants, just ask the uh, kind of head of department or the lead consultant and they should be able to tell you and then check in with Alana or Maria and say, oh, you know, I've been this whole, this is my um, trainer. Is that okay? Um, or alternatively, if they're not sure, just clarify with the college and we'll get that info to you. So I suppose it really depends. Sometimes some rotations would have two BSC trainees. Sometimes they have one. So it does vary a little bit. Uh, but they're assigned by the college and then there's a little bit of movement depending on the number of trainees and the available consultants. Okay. Is that, is that fair? Uh, I'll just add, add on to uh, what Connor said, said there. Yeah. Um, just to, to add on to that as well, um, I know there's a question about access to ePortfolio and you will all get your access to ePortfolio. Your trainer will be listed on your dashboard there as well. And sometimes yeah. there, you know, it might be that it actually, when you get to the hospital, it's been changed or there's something different and that will be managed by Maria and Milena. But in general, uh, you'll see who you have there. Okay. Yeah, so you can check in at that once you get access to your portfolio and, and meet with that consultant. And if there's been a reassignment for some reason, just check back with the college. It's fairly straightforward. Right, so that answers a question that I see here. Um, should my BSTE portfolio be set up already? Um, yeah, I, uh, apologies, uh, we're running just a bit behind, but that is taking place this week. Everybody should have access by this time next week. Okay. So um, I have a question here from Leah Laughlin. Um, so this is about examinations. Um, obviously, it's a time of great uncertainty at the moment. For those of us hoping to get through part two, uh, is it likely that the clinical clinical exams will proceed this year. So, um, Lee, I'm, I'm not sure whether um, you, you've apparently- I'll, I'll answer that if you- Great. Can I just answer that? Yes, please. The, the college intention at the moment is to make a clinical exam available before the end of year. There is a meeting with the boards of all of the clinical exams taking place on Monday, where we're going to look at what possibilities are in place. Obviously, a lot of that is going to be dependent on hospital policies. We don't want to run an exam that isn't equivalent to the previous year's exam, 
but um, there may be some adjustments made to the clinical to, to mean that it can run, but the commitment the exam board has given is to do their best to run a clinical that's going to mean people can proceed. And if we've got issues with that in terms of HST internally, we will be able to, to manage that around deadlines for interviews and things like that. But at the moment, the college's commitment is to make every effort we can for that to happen. But we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet because we just don't know what the policies um, in the hospitals are going to be on, on running events like that as well. Hey, thank you, Ashley. Um, so Jane, I'm uh, seeing there was uh, an earlier question here about mandatory courses. Uh, my understanding is that um, those are in the process of being assigned. Um, I wonder, do you know uh, when we might expect to know more about uh, course dates? I, uh, yeah, so we're allocating the dates at the moment. So we should have the dates for the leadership and communications courses available early next week. Um, and then more dates will follow after that. Great. Um, so uh, I, I, there's like 49 people on the call and yet I only have three or four questions. Has anybody else got uh, questions for us or for the uh, trainees or for Dr. Hensey? Uh, so, so one of the things, just while you're waiting on questions, I, I forgot to, I realized I never included in my talk, and I hope it may have been covered, I was caught up in clinic, but it might have been covered um, by some of the other panelists. But one of the things that my role as part of um, my introductory video, and again, those videos are a little bit artificial and it's hard sometimes to uh, put them together, but one of my roles was to kind of explain, I suppose, where the BST fits in and what our goal is overall um, with the BSC program. And I think the easiest way to explain this is we want to give you that training and experience, a foundation in pediatrics that will allow you move from the role of an SHO to be ready to take up a role as a registrar or SPR. And that's really the goal of the program. And that's why it's structured in such a way that you've got a variety of experience, including a core of neonatology and general pediatrics, and why there's some subspecialist um, experience as well and a regional and um, I suppose regional basis to the program. And um, that's again what the mandatory courses, the examinations, and all the training days are building towards. So I think it's nice to have an idea of what is the, the real goal of the program and that's what we want. We want to instill, I suppose, uh, ideally, we want you really to develop a love and enjoy the program and enjoy your pediatric training and it's working towards getting you ready to the next stage and, and, and um, developing those core foundation skills. So just in case, because I realized I didn't quite cover that in my um, introductory talk. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear about that and everybody has an idea of where they're going. Great. Milena, oh. could I just, just add yeah. on about, about mandatory courses there as well? Just um, obviously we're allocating this year, so that's cha a change because there were issues with people getting spaces in time. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the reason for that was to do with people, you know, having no shows on the courses and empty places uh, being on, on courses that are running. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're saying if you've got a, a problem with attending, do you get in touch? I know sometimes things come up last minute, but it means that we can give places that open up to people, but it shouldn't be a problem this year. And if at the end of running all the pre-allocated courses, everyone still hasn't managed to attend for some reason, just get in touch and let us know what happened and we'll do our best to put you onto another course. And if there's a significant amount of people, we'll run an, an additional course at the end of the year but do try and get to the date that you've been allocated. It's just going to make life easier for you um, in, in, in terms of getting all those out of the way. Okay. Um, so I think maybe that answers a question. We got quite a few questions that just came in. Um, uh, Attendee is asking if the courses uh, will be run more frequently if they tend to book out quickly. So um, hopefully what you've just said clarifies that um, nobody's going to be you know, missing out because a course booked out, hopefully. So um, I have a question here uh, from Sinead uh, about uh, APLS. Um, I don't know if this applies to other people on the call, but she's asking if an APLS from uh, UK or Australia or New Zealand suffices for the BST. Yes, um, it's the same 
okay. the same course, slight differences, but we'd be happy for that to suffice as long as it's in date. You know, remember, you need to have it in date as well for the HST. So it's a good practice to look and see when am I next due to the AP. Do the AP lesson, book in when you can. But as long as it's in date, that's fine. Okay. There was another question about audits I saw there about is there a mandatory number of audits we would like each trainee to be involved on a yearly basis with an auditor research project. This would be similar to the, I suppose, professional competency standards at the Medical Council of Ireland. So we kind of expect our trainees to complete the same, um, to meet the same requirements. And a lot of those requirements will be met, obviously, as part of your training program. So that would be our expectation. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, do we pay for the full cost of the APLS ourselves? I can answer that. Um, yes, you do up front, but there's a, a CPT fund that you can get retained through, and every trainee has access to that. Okay. Um, so uh, I also have a question. Um, do we have a different trainer in each site? Um, I believe the answer to that is generally yes. Yes, um, obviously your <laughs> trainer should be supervising you directly on your site, so you will. I mean, I think it's fair to say that you will develop relationships with your trainers and some of your trainers you may go back to for advice and support, even if you've moved site. But at each site, you'll have a designated trainer. Okay. Um, and each post, actually, sorry, also if you're within the same site and moving post, you will probably be assigned a new trainer. Okay. Um, so... Uh, an attendee uh, was asking about uh, the MRCPI exams. Um, will we get an email uh, or do we need to keep an eye on the RCPI website? Um, my understanding is the answer is both. Um, so I certainly will uh, be letting you know when I know that um, registration is open, but uh, you also should uh, keep an eye on the website and you can always email examinations at rcpi.ie if you have any um, questions about when the next exam is going to be open. Um, we, we do publish as well windows of when they'll be so when there might not be a final agreed date there will be a, a broad date quite well in advance so that you can do some planning around that as well. Okay um, a couple of more questions about APLS here do we need both APLS and PALS in our first year of BST? Um, and will there be APLS courses available this year? Um, so to my understanding, there obviously weren't APLS courses for a time period. I think that they are getting back up and running. Um, if there aren't, obviously we can deal with that when we come to it. Uh, but I think that our expectation is that you would do either APLS or PALS. Our preference is for APLS. I think it's probably more relevant to our local setting and it's the guidelines and standards that would be more, most regularly used in Irish hospitals. So um, the APLS and PALS are relatively equivalent, but our preference would be that you book into an APLS. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the queue. Um, so sorry there's, there, sorry, there's one there in the chat though that's not in the yeah. queue. It's just about neonates. I so yeah. Is NPR and uh, okay instead of my BLS is out of date, but finding it difficult to get a course date. I'm in neonates and will be completing my NRP. Uh, yeah. So, but my probably advice to that trainee would be just to complete your NRP. It's what you'll need in your. Um, neonates and then look at your BLS or even perhaps just doing the APLS if sometimes as part of it, depending on when your BLS was last done they might let you go ahead and just do it all together as part of the APLS with a brief assessment initially uh, so look into that rather than worrying too much about it while you're doing your neonates just do your NRP and get settled in in neonates okay oh and here's a great question maybe to finish up with could this talk be recorded for those of us who are late uh, yeah, so we do have the presentations. Obviously, I'll have to get um, approval from the contributors, but uh, certainly you can have my slides and um, we will share other content. The, the Q&A section has been recorded as well, so we can, give, we can give the transcript of that out so that people have the answers to the questions that were asked. Okay. 
Uh, I think I think it's always very artificial. We would have loved to have met with you all in person. So I, I don't know if anyone said this at the start. We apologise. We can't do that. It's obviously much more social and enjoyable. Um, I did say I hope that in the coming weeks we'll set up another catch-up that will be more about to discuss how you're getting on in your posts and hopefully maybe even have some breakout rooms amongst the trainees so you guys can all get to know each other a little bit better. Um, we would normally do that face to face, but we'll try and do it as best we can in, in a virtual environment because I think it's really helpful to be able to bounce things off um, and discuss things with your own, with your peers and your, your trainees. It's a great, great uh, resource to have. So we'll try and set that up as best we can. All right, so um, if there are no more questions or no more questions that uh, you want to address on the call, um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you and good night, everyone, and look forward to getting a chance to meet and talk more with all of you in the coming months. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah. Bye.